our series through the book of Hebrews. And uh, got my nifty clicker here. Again, we're in Hebrews chapter 11. And uh, there we go. And uh, so if you go ahead and turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, I want to give a brief recap. Pastor Jim uh, started off um, in Hebrews 11 yesterday. He got through four verses and uh, did a great job on breaking it down. Now, Hebrews 11 is known for, I'm sorry, youth, you may be dismissed. Love you guys. Uh, Continue to just pray for the youth and Marcos and Serena as they're leading our future. Amen, guys? So. We're, uh, we're in the book of Hebrews, and um, so I want to, oh, Hebrews chapter 11, it's known as the chapter of faith, or often known as the heroes of faith, because it goes on to start and talk about what, it starts the chapter off by talking about what faith is, and then it goes on and explains a bunch of people who um, showed, their faith, uh, uh, showed their faith in their life, in their obedience to God throughout the chapter. So it's called the chapter of faith, um, it talks about the heroes of faith. And it starts off the chapter by talking about faith and the definition. Now, this is important for us to know, and I just want to recap on it since we're still in chapter 11, uh, starting in verses 1 through 3. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the people of old received their commendation. The people we're going to talk about it in this chapter and throughout the Bible. By faith, verse 3, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of the Things that are visible. So this word faith here is a word in the Greek, pistis, which means conviction of truth, trust, confidence. As uh, Pastor Jim explained last week, faith isn't an uncertain hope, a blind faith, having faith in faith, uh, just positive thinking or Christian optimism. That's not what faith is. And I think all too often, many times, we use, as Christians, use the word faith as a blind faith. Like, we can't understand something, so we just say, well, you just need to have faith. Like, that's the band-aid that answers the questions for everything we don't understand. And I don't think that when someone has a serious question, and they come to you, and they ask you, I don't understand this. What is it? Can you explain this in the Bible? I, I'm having doubt. Well, you just got to have faith. Is that, a suffi- that is correct, but is that a sufficient answer that we should just slap a band-aid on it? I don't think so, because if you're really hurting and you're really struggling, you don't want to just hear, you got to have faith. That doesn't answer anything. That just says, well, you got to, it's like when it talks about in James, when somebody's in need of food or they don't have clothing, you say, well, go get some food, be well, right? <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. They have a need. They need a need supplied. If they would have had food, they wouldn't have a need in the first place. So when someone has a need, just slapping the faith band-aid on it might not be sufficient. And we shouldn't use that just to, hey, you got to have faith. Because many times we use it as this blind faith I don't understand. But faith, the word pistis here in the definition of faith that's given in Scripture means a conviction of truth, trust, and confidence. Those things aren't blind. Those things aren't just optimism. For uh, in an NIV, it, it uh, explains it like this. Now, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Faith is confidence in what we hope for. Pastor Jim went in and explaining hope, a living hope, all last week. So I encourage you guys, if you aren't here, go back and check on our website or app or on YouTube um, or Facebook, whatever it may be. Go listen to last week's um, message. But it's a confidence in what we hope for. And it's assurance about what we do not see. Confidence means having full trust. For example, when we have faith in our spouse, we are confident in them, in their relationship to us, right? We say, I have faith in my spouse. They are being faithful. That means you're confident and you have trust with your spouse, doesn't it? It's not a, oh, I have faith in them. I hope they're faithful. Oh, I get, oh, who knows? It's blind, I, maybe, let's hope so. No, it's a confidence. You trust in them. You trust, you have faith in what they say. They're, uh, they made their vows that they're going to fulfill. They're going to continue on with it. It's a confidence. And going in a verse, uh, reviewing in verse um, 1 through 3, it talks about, um, I just want to touch on something. Pastor Jim, now faith is assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Tied into verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So what is seen was not made out of the things that are visible. So I think this could be taken in a naturalistic way and in a spiritual way. 
Pastor Jim talked about it, how everything is made up of molecules and atoms, things that are naked to the visible eye. And that's true, so the things that are seen are made with things that are not seen to the naked eye. I also want to touch on a a perspective of, by faith we understand the universe was created by the word of God. First of all, God is immaterial, the immaterial substance, so he can't see God. And also the word spoken forth that are visible. See, everything that we know, because creation is already here, is made out of things that are visible. You came from your mama. Your mama came from her mama, right? Animals create animals. Food comes from the ground. Things that already existed. Nothing comes out of thin air. Nothing comes from invisible things, right? But with God, when there was no material things to create Him, He is an immaterial uh, person, an immaterial mind, if you will, that transcends material, time, in, in space, he's outside of it. So the things that we can't see, God has made everything that we do see. And that's another perspective to look at it as well. So when we see things, the fine-tuning of our universe, the way that we could reason, we could uh, talk, uh, converse, we could love one another, we're greater than the animal kingdom, even the smartest animal out there, we could reason with one another, we can, we can do things together, and the animals cannot. We're created in the image of God. So when we see these things that astonish us, we see God's thumbprint on it. So when we see the things that he created, we know attached to it is something that we can't see, namely God. Amen, church? So I just want to review that part, and <clears throat> moving on in verse 4. I'm not going to uh, dig into verse 4. Um, I'll read it. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Pastor Jim did a good job on breaking this down last week, um, discussing about faith that presses on, a faith that endures, a living hope. Um, And this chapter is going to name a bunch of people. I'm not going to go into extreme depth of everybody. We did a series maybe about a year ago that we called it By Faith. And it, we went through and we broke down many, not all, but many of these characters in the Bible and preached a sermon on each, in each one of them, broke them down. And why are they mentioned in here? I mentioned uh, we did S- Samson, Noah, Abraham, Enoch, um, all these people. So go back if you want a more in depth look at it. We're just reading through the chapter, but if you want an in depth look at why these people are mentioned, Go back and check out that series because we went and broke it down a little bit further. Uh, so, going on to verse 5, it says, By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found, because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Interesting. Enoch. Enoch's not mentioned that many times in the Bible. He's mentioned here, he's mentioned in the Old Testament, and he's referenced a couple of times in the New Testament. But in Genesis 5, it says, When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. So we see the Old Testament confirming what was written in the New. And they, these two is about the most in-depth in the Bible <clears throat> that you get about Enoch. But for someone who pleased God and was taken up with God and did not taste death, he must have been pretty important. Right. Only Enoch and Elijah were the two people mentioned in the Bible who were taken up and did not die physically. We don't know a lot about Enoch but we do have an extra canonical book called the Book of Enoch. There's Enoch 1, 2, and 3. Jude quotes from the Book of Enoch. Jesus quotes from the Book of Enoch. But the Book of Enoch is not in our Bible that you probably have sitting in your lap. Now, the Ethiopian Bible has the Book of Enoch still in it. So the question is, why are they taken out? Well, it's debated. Some people think it doesn't align with Scripture. Some people think the Catholic Church took it out back in the day because it was too far out there. And it is far out there because it talks about all the watchers who descended from heaven, who made it with the sons or the daughters of men, who created Nephilim and giants. And Enoch was the judge 
of these of the watchers. It goes all into it, and it's pretty. It is pretty far out, but <clears throat> the Bible quotes it. The book of uh, Enoch directly. We see Enoch mentioned in the Bible, and for a man to be taken up from the earth because he pleased God, uh, he um, must have been pretty important. So Enoch judged the watchers. So when the the um, and I'm going to get into it a little bit more in Genesis six when I talk about Noah, but basically he presented judgments to just like um, other prophets in the Old Testament, Jeremiah or whatever. He presented prophecies and judgments and warnings to God's people. That's who Enoch God used Enoch to present warnings to the watchers, the angels who came down from heaven, left their first estate, saw that the women were beautiful on the earth. And, and made it with him and created what we call Nephilim. And there's different races of Nephilim mentioned in the Bible, like the Rephaim and different Anunnaki's. Uh, and here's the thing. Giants exist. I'm going to get into it in a little bit. Um, but only Enoch and Elijah are the two people in the Bible who are mentioned having God taken them up. Now, we know a lot about Elijah, and he's an important guy, an important prophet. But not much is known about Enoch. But here's another thing uh, people think about these two men, Enoch and Elijah, is that they'll make an appearance again in the end of days in Revelation 3. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. That's weird to cut it off. Clothed in sackcloth. So many people, although it doesn't specifically mention these two witnesses, Many people think that these two witnesses are Enoch and Elijah because there's only two people in the Bible who never tasted death. They were taken up in their bodies. They will appear again. God grants them authority and power um, to cause plagues to to fall upon the land. And they're going to prophesy to the people and warn them of the the, the, coming judgment and to repent. And it says that a beast will rise from the bottomless pit and kill both of them. After three and a half days of their dead bodies laying there, the whole world will watch upon their bodies, gaze upon their dead bodies, and then God breathes lives back in their bodies, and then they send back to heaven or back up to, with God. So that's just a, a little nugget for you guys about Enoch and Elijah. So many people, it's debated because there's no specific names given here, but many people think it will be those two people. But like I said, we don't know about Enoch, but we know that he pleased God. And in verse 6, it's interesting, right after it talks about Enoch, and without faith, it is impossible to please him without this confidence, without, without this trust that we have, without the pistis that we talked about to have in God, it's impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So check this out. First it said that Enoch pleased God. Then it goes into verse 6. And it connects that without faith, faith, it's impossible to please God. So it's easy to make the assumption that Enoch had a tremendous amount of faith. Because if Enoch pleased God, and it takes faith to please God, Enoch must have had a tremendous amount of faith with God. He had a tremendous amount of trust and confidence with God. And God said, I need you up here, Enoch. I need you up here with me says that he walked with God. He must have had a seriously close relationship with him because he pleased God so much by his confidence, by his faith, by his trust in God. says that he walked with God. God said, I need you up here with me, man. (laughs) It's interesting, the scripture says, it doesn't say that it's difficult to please God. It says that it's impossible to please God without faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. The first step is that you, got, you can't, um, it says, you must, for whoever would draw near to God, must believe that he exists. So first, you got to believe that God exists. That's the first step. You're not having any faith in God if you believe that he doesn't exist or that, uh, you know, only naturalism is true or that we were, were some primordial ooze in our our from fish to philosopher, our great ancestors are just pawn scum, and we're just flesh bags of stardust uh, dancing in the own rhythm of our DNA. 
If you don't believe that God exists, then you'll never have faith. You'll never please God. And um, he'll never draw close to you. So the first step is believing that God exists. But that's not enough. It's not just enough to believe that God exists because, as we see in James 2, you say you have faith for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. So it's not just enough to believe that God exists because even the demons believe that God exists. Oh, they know he exists. Satan knows he exists. And guess what? They probably know Scripture better than we do. Satan quoted Scripture. To Jesus, did he not? They were around when the scripture was being written. Guarantee you they could quote more verses than you and I can. And they believe that he exists. And they tremble in terror. So it's not enough just to believe that he exists. Yeah, that's the first step. But it's not enough. You need a second part. Coupled with believing in existence... You must have deep conviction of God's moral character. And one of them being specifically, as was mentioned, those who draw near to God, those must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. Drawing near to God. Not only believing in existence, but seeking him out. Seeking him out. Pursuing him. That's got to be what Enoch did. Constantly pursuing him, seeking him out, striving for the relationship, pressing in, growing in his faith, his confidence, his trust as a relationship. He walked with God, man. And God said, get up here. I need you. <laughs> I need you at headquarters. For, so first we must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. In Matthew 7, it says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Jesus says, Look, if you seek for me, you are going to find me. I'm not going to hide myself from you. People say, Well, there's not enough evidence for God. Do you seek him, though? Do you knock on the door? Do you ask him to reveal himself to you? Because he says, when you seek him, you will find. If you knock, it will be open. Anyone who asks, you shall receive. It goes on to say, he compares our Father in heaven to uh, our uh, fathers on earth. What, what kid of yours is going to ask you for some bread and you're going to give him a rock? Right or some fish, and you're going to give them a scorpion. And in other words, if someone's in need of something, our kid, we're not going to harm them. We're going to take care of them. We're going to meet their needs. If they ask, we're going to give it. I mean, it's different. But if they're if they're hungry, if they need clothing, if they need their needs met, we give it to them. Right? They want another Xbox, Xbox One, and Xbox Five and Six. So what happened to the other Xboxes you had? Well, they're there still. Sorry, ask and you shall not find, son. <laughs> you guys understand what I'm saying? He says, so you parents, you fathers on earth, if your kid asks you, how much more your heavenly father, the perfect father, will give to you if you ask him? Amen. See, as I said before, with the Bible, so often when we're reading it, we automatically jump to a, try to find a spiritual application. There's usually always a practical application and a spiritual application. Once we get the practical, the spiritual comes. We try to, if we try to jump to the spiritual, what does he mean by the Father will give? The practical is you're a parent, or you at least understand parenthood, a loved one. You understand supplying the needs of your kids. Spiritually, our Father does the same. Always seek for the practical application in Scripture and then say, God, give me the spiritual with it, you know? Amen. So, if you seek him, you will find him. See, the negation of this is if you don't seek God, he's not going to reward you. 
And those who He rewards those who seek Him. And you're looking at your life, you're like, man, there's no blessings from God. I don't know if He exists. I always feel like I'm in Grumble Alley on Barely Get Along Street. Right? We taught a, a series called uh, Leaving Grumble Alley. If you have a problem with grumbling and complaining and not being content with life, go back and listen to that series ten times and get convicted because it applies to everybody, including myself. But if you find yourself stuck in Grumble Alley, look at your, evaluate. The scripture says, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith, right? We need to examine ourselves as Christians. So we need to go back and look at our life. How am I pursuing God? Just on Sundays? What if you pursued another relationship like that in your life? How fruitful would that relationship be? Your spouse, maybe your, your, your kid, you only spoke to them for like an hour once a week. That was it. It wouldn't be a fruitful relationship. I understand some cases that's all you can with your kids and you make the most of that. But I think you understand what I'm trying to say. Look at your relationship. He's saying he will reward those who seek him. You ask, it will be given. You knock, it will be open. You seek and you shall find. If there's a lack of blessings in your life, look at your relationship and how you pursue it. Because Enoch, man, he was, re- 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 well, hello. he was rewarded so greatly, God pulled him up to heaven. The ultimate reward. Keep moving forward now. Verse 7 in Hebrews. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So, we're all familiar with Noah and the ark, right? Sunday school, we see little pictures with giraffe sticking his head out the little boat and a jolly um, Noah with his stick, you know, all the animals coming in. We've watched movies. We've heard the story a hundred times. But I find it interesting in verse 5, he goes from Enoch who judged the watchers because of their sin to a man who judged the giants that came from the watchers which brought forth their destruction. See, the, men- the Bible only mentions three people who walked with God. Enoch, Noah, and Levi. Now, there's other mentions of they walked in his commandments, they walked in his statue. But using the words, walked with God, as in a relationship, as far as I found, there's only three people. Enoch, Noah, and Levi. Now, you think, what about Adam and, Eve? Adam and Eve? They walked with God in the garden. Well, actually, the Bible says that after they sinned, they heard God walking in the garden trying to find them. So a little different. But walking in relationship, Noah and Enoch, it's interesting, both of them dealt directly with the watchers and the Nephilim. And actually, I want to touch on that right now. Genesis 6, 1 through 8. You ready? When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and the daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive. And they they took as their wives any they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide a man forever, for he is flesh, his day shall be 120 years. Let's stop. So first of all, we saw like Enoch lived 365 years. So at this point, at the flood era, God cut man's life short. And we don't see anybody really get close to 120 years, but we see a few people peek into the hundreds and like, man, they really lived a, a long life. Well, I think Methuselah lived uh, 900 and something years. But God cut man's life short. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. Those days and afterward. When the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. 
So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the face of the land, man and animals and creepy things and birds of the heavens, for I'm sorry that I've made them, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. I'm going to break something down for you. I'm not going to be able to go in as much depth as I, was li- as I would like to. I would love to do like a, a series on the giants and the Nephilim and the watchers and all that kind of stuff. But um, here's the thing is that many people have a problem with the flooding of Noah. Why would God wipe out the population of earth and animals and babies just because he was sorry that he made them? What kind of God creates this faulty um, human race just because they're evil and mad at each other? Uh, Every intention of the thought of the heart was only evil continually. Oh, so they're evil people, so he just wiped them out. People have a hard time swallowing. How can a loving God do this? Well, if you haven't thought of this, let me bring a different perspective to you because this is the perspective that I hold. The earth at this time, as we read in Genesis 6, was inhabited by giants. So the angels descended from the original estate. They saw that the women on the earth were beautiful. They took whatever woman they wanted, procreated with them, and created these things called Nephilim, which are called abominations. So when a man and woman come together, they have a human. When an angel, who's not created in the image of God, comes together with a human, You create a hybrid that's not human, that's called an abomination, that's no longer created in the image of God. You tracking with me? Whose DNA is corrupted. Now, I can't tell you how it works, but spiritual beings, they know how it works. I can't tell you how the Spirit of God came in Mary's womb and impregnated her, but the spiritual interacted with the physical Angels interacted with the physical. Now, they took on flesh form as Satan was banished from heaven. These angels fell. They saw the women. They mated with them. And these giants, these giants ravished the earth. I'm going to show you some here. So on the very left, says six foot, present day man. Next to it says eight foot, six inch man. Maxim, Maximinus Thrax, Caesar of Rome in 235 AD. So the Caesar was eight foot. 12 foot Goliath, we know that in 1 Samuel. 1010 BC. 15 foot southeast Turkey, found in the late 1950s. Uh, 1950s, 15 foot man. 18-foot man, OG, king of Bashan in Deuteronomy 3. It gives the dimensions of his bed. He was the king. He's the last last king of his race of giants mentioned in Deuteronomy 3, 1400 B.C. 19-foot-6 in 5077 A.D. under an overturned oak tree. um, And it's cut off where it says where the location is. 23-foot man. Found in 1456 A.D. in France, besides a river in Valence. 25.6 foot person in 1613 A.D. in France, near the castle of Chamont, near a complete, nearly a complete skeleton. 36 foot man in 650 B.C. to 640 A.D. Car- Carthaginians uncovered two sides. An earthquake in Samorian Bosphorus. Um, Revealed this 36 foot giant. So, why am I telling you all this stuff? In the book of Enoch, let me just say something here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on a little tangent, but it, it, it's important information to have. The book of Enoch goes into more depth about the giants. So, you may say, well, the book of John or the Enoch is not um, a canonical book, 66 books. And you're right, it's not. So, why are you talking about it at the pulpit? Well, I'll tell you why, because it's extra biblical. The Bible quotes from it, and just because it's not in the canon doesn't mean we can't have useful information to draw from it. See, I could come up here and quote from um, The Purpose Driven Life to give some further maybe revelation or ideas on the, on a biblical text, and no one would have a problem with it, even though it's extra biblical text. 
But if I come up in here and say something from the book of Enoch, many times we're programmed to demonize extra, these extra biblical books as if they can't give us more information. Now, you can reject it. That's fine. But I say if it's synchronized with the Bible, it's obviously known about in the Bible because Jesus quotes from it. The book of Jude quotes directly from it. It's known about from these Jews who are reading these books. Um, and it gives us extra information the man, about the man Enoch and about the giants. I say we could take information from it if it's synchronized with the Scripture as long as it doesn't contradict and get a fuller picture of what's going on. In fact, there's other extra biblical texts. For example, the book of Jasher. But in, in Hebrew, my Yeshar, but in English we would say Jashar. It's mentioned twice in the Bible and it's referenced another time. For example, you know the story when Joshua, it's in the book of Joshua, when he was battling and the sun stopped. If you read that text, it says, Is it not written in the book of Jasher that the sun stood still? Is it not written in the book of Jasher? Uh, book of Jasher, I think my Bible's incomplete, guys. It's not canonized either. But he was writing to the Jews, the receivers of this text, they knew the book of Jasher. Is it not written? Like, you know it's written in the book of Jasher. Extra biblical, but it was a... T- they all knew, and they understood the story more in depth as where we just got a glimpse of it in the canon. It's not that... It doesn't mean that we're missing out on things. It means that there's extra biblical text. In the Dead Sea Scrolls that were found, we found a lot of scrolls that we don't have in the, in the Bible as well as scrolls that we do. Like the, book, the great scroll of Isaiah, it's the biggest, most complete scroll that they found that's 98% accurate to what we have right here. The only difference is transmission of languages. But there's also a book called the Book of Giants that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that was very fragmented, but we're able to extract some things from it. But here's the thing. Giants roam the land. Goliath was just a little baby giant. We're all familiar with the Goliath giant, and we don't deny it. But when it starts to get into these bigger giants, we're like, yeah, right, that's what you mean, like, fee fi fo fum I smell the, the blood of an Englishman. But yet, through archaeological digging and sometimes mistakes, just earthquake happened and opened up the earth, and the 36 foot skeleton was found you could find pictures there's a lot of fake ones out there but if you do your research you could find pictures people standing next to human femur bones as tall as them six feet long so imagine this for a second 36 foot giants cruising around the earth the book of giants talks about that wars between each other they're extremely violent vicious they were not made in the image of god they're abominations Many of them had six fingers, six toes, double rows of teeth, deformations in their skull. I'll get into that in a second. But they were cannibals. They would ravish the earth, destroying it. I'm a six foot one guy. I eat a lot. If I was a 36 foot guy, imagine how much food I'd be eating. You couldn't, I couldn't stop eating. I'd be eating everything in sight. People, cows, trees. But destroying it all. Now imagine a world populated from 36 down to 12 foot giants. How they would ravish. And remember what the Genesis said. Every intent of their heart was only evil continually. Evil, wicked giants ravishing the earth. Now what's interesting, whenever these giants are dug up and you find bones and stuff. And there's been hundreds and thousands of cases. And why don't we hear about it? Many times the uh, Smithsonian Institute and the, the Vatican, they'll come. You call and say, hey, I found some bones. You know, you want to do the right thing. Say, maybe this is going to a museum. Dinosaur, I don't know. They come in and they'll many times, many, many times, most times, I would say, they come in and take the, the bones and say, hey, we got to take these in for examination. And you'll never see them again and you'll never hear about it again. Here's the thing. If giants exist, the Bible's true. If you have giant bones in the ground, the Bible's talked about giants for thousands of years. We don't see them now because of the flood took out the most of them. The Israelites going in and wiping out the land of Canaan and pretty much destroying the rest of them. And then there's theories about other things. But 
We don't really see him. I mean, we don't see him running around today, right? But when God destroyed the earth, he destroyed it not just because people were wicked, because that there was abominations, 36-foot-tall abominations, destroying everything. The book of Giants, let's go back to Genesis when it says, the Lord regretted that he made man on the earth. It grieved him to his heart. Imagine all the wickedness going on in the earth right now. What would grieve God so much that he would regret making man? Unless there was something more going on than what's already going on today. Abominations. I'll blot out man whom I've created on the face of the, of the land. Man, animals, and creepy things. Why, why, the, the man, why the animals and creepy things? In the book of Giants, it talks about these watchers um, sinning. It uses the word sinning against animals and humans and plants. I don't know how you do it with plants, but basically crossbreeding going on. Now, you may think this is all fairy tales. Okay, that's fine. But here's the thing is that I want to connect some dots for you. Angels brought down certain things. You ever wonder why, how drugs get used today? Whoever thought of drugs, whoever was the first one to use it. Or what about witchcraft and spells? How does somebody say the right things using the right objects and the right ways to somehow conjure a demon? Unless that information was given to them. In the book of Enoch, it says that these watchers came down and taught human beings uh, sinful things, shameful things, such as drug use, such as witchcraft and sorcery and spells, and also other things like beautification for women. That's why in the New Testament, it talks about, you know, women in the head coverings because of the angels. That was just thrown in there. That was weird, Paul. Uh, not beautiful. It's not about outward appearance, but about inward, right? You see these weird things that don't always make sense. They're not just cultural, but they go outside of the culture in reference back to the Old Testament. But these watchers came down and taught these things, and they had technology that we don't, including the knowledge of how to crossbreed. So when we see these things, for example, the mighty men who were of old, men of renown in verse 4. Legends, people who are still talked about to this day. Legends, men of renown, mighty men, men of, they were of old. So the thought behind this is that when you have angels crossbreeding and creating giants, they worship them. They worship giants as gods. And if you look in the Old Testament, about all these people worshiping these gods with names. When a god dies, they create statues after him. Do you think, what are these idiots worshiping stone? Or are they worshiping something, someone who actually existed? Diana, Artemis of Ephesians. Uh, Let me throw some other names. Apollo, Thor. Thursday is actually Thor's day. If you look at the etymology of our calendar, paganism and false gods is everywhere today. In fact, they, we worship them in a different way. We put them in movies and make comic books out of them and make these false gods who were once worshipped as real gods, as demigods back in the day, fallen angels, Nephilim. And that's why when the Israelites went into the land of Canaan. He's like, don't worship any gods. Don't take on any foreign wives because with them you'll take on their false gods and their false worship. And guess what they did? Inhabited their camp and destruction came. That's why there's such strict rules about this because they worshiped giants. They're still talked about today, but we perceive them as fiction because that's how they're presented to us as in comic books and movies. But why they, they're not just campfire stories, they're still presented to us today. And in Greek mythology is actually Greek history. We just call it mythology because we can't conceive of these things being true. So, we also, some things that we've found is elongated skulls. These are our skulls that are found, that are dig, dug up in Egypt, in Inca, Peru, South America, of these elongated skulls. Now, many people think that this is just 
skull binding, like they bind the feet or they extend the neck, these um, cultural things. And they do things, something called skull binding, where as a baby, they strap the head with leather straps real tight and elongates the skull. Well, here's the problem with that, is that if you bind a skull, you're still going to have the same suture lines, the periental plates here. We all have these fractures in our head, right? You're going to have the same thing even if you bind your head. Those don't go away. The skulls that are found, there's zero suture lines and different, different suture lines, I should say. And the plates, parietal plates, are completely gone on, up top. That's not a human skull. That's a different skull. And these are the skulls that are found with these elongated skulls. These are found. Now, what's interesting, remember I said they breed giants and abominations? And these are found in Peru and Egypt. What's interesting, we've seen those Egyptian statues wearing those crazy hats, right? What fits perfectly inside those hats? Elongated skulls. Now, a lot of times we've, they've found mummified uh, remains with babies with elongated skulls in the womb still. Now, we know Egypt is heavily pagan with their worship of gods. And we see this not only in the Bible, but we see it in history, we see it in extra-biblical text, and we see it in archaeology. I would love to get into all this more and more and more depth because there's a lot more, but I wanted to touch on this, that giants and abominations did exist. And it says it in our Bibles, And there's other proofs as well. Now, moving on to Noah's Ark. We talked about Noah's Ark, and I'm going to come to an end here, guys. Just stay with me. Noah's Ark, because we talked about Noah, who brought judgment upon the world, the abominations, right, the tainted bloodline. Noah's Ark was about 500. This is actually in, uh, I think, Kentucky. It's called the Ark Exhibit or Ark Experience, something like that. And a guy named Ken Ham help fund and put this together. It's actually a replicated size of the ark. And you could go in there and see it and see the size of it and visit it. I haven't. It'd be fun to do someday. But inside they show how it is possible to hold the animals. Now it's not, people ask, how can this boat hold every single animal? It doesn't say every animal. It says two of each kind. For example, all canines can be traced back to the alpha, a wolf. And from there, through crossbreeding and through, uh, you know, um, microevolution, I guess you call it, adaptation is a better word, you get different breeds. So all you need is two wolf, and you got the whole canine kind covered. So, yeah, you can cover, have two of each kind of each animal, and they prove it. They build it. And um, just some structural uh, things of the size of the ark. It's 510 feet long, which is about one and a half football fields, or you could fit three space shuttles on top of it. Um, 50 feet taller uh, than a modern four-story house, which there's not too many four-story houses out there, so you get the idea of how big this thing was. Um, Storage capacity of 450 semi-trailers. So one one semi-trailer, a livestock trailer, can hold about um, 250 sheep. So if you multiply that by 450, that's 120,000 sheep the ark could hold. Well, it only needed two, though. <laughs> two of a kind, though. But it's just giving you that, the idea of the capacity of the ark. So it took him 120 years to build, possibly because it was so massive, or because God wanted to give time for people to repent, the people to repent, to repent, to repent, Because the whole time he was preaching that God's bringing judgment through this thing called rain. Like, what's rain? It's He's going to flood the earth. Don't worry about it. (laughs) You guys need to repent. 120 years. It's only him and his family. Eight, right? It talks about this. And reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household, what we read. The ark was an outward expression of Moses, of Noah's faith. It symbolized his faith. The boat did. 
because he believed he had trust in God that God was bringing judgment. God used Noah to save a remnant. The boat showed Noah's faith, the evidence of it. And by that, his household was saved because of his obedience and his faith to God. Men, you got to hear this out. Or if you're the head, if you're not married or what, maybe you're watching, uh, you raise your grandkids, the head of the household, this applies to you. Listen to this. Noah's faith saved his household. As men, as heads of our household, our faith in God and trusting in him where he's leading us directly affects our household, our obedience to God. It directly affects that, the well-being of our household. We lead, we direct, we follow Christ, and as we follow him, we lead our families into God's will. In 1 Corinthians 11.3, it says this, But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of his wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. The wife's head is her husband. The husband's head is Christ. And the head of Christ is God. Remember he said on earth, I I do only what the Father tells me to do. He always pointed glory back to God. Worship team, you could come on up here. Help me close. Here's an illustration. The biggest umbrella is Father God, right? Under him, Jesus. Under him, the man, the head of the household. And then the wife, under submission. The scripture talks about wives submitting to husbands. The, 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 um, you know, popularization of this, trying to, this whole toxic masculinity the world tries to put on men these days, trying to shame us for being who God created us to be, for being men. We're created differently. At one breath, they want equalization and say, I can self-identify with whatever sex. And the other, in the other way, they, they cast us aside and saying, you're toxic masculinity. Well, what about equality? God made men a certain way and females a certain way, Right? And we should rejoice in how God made us. Amen. See, God put the headship upon man. And it says that the wife should be submissive to that. There's nothing demeaning about the wife being submissive to the, to the husband. There's nothing that makes her less human. There's nothing demeaning about it, Just like there's nothing demeaning about Jesus being submissive to Father God. It doesn't make him less divine because he's submissive to it, to, to Father God. It's not demeaning to Jesus. It's not demeaning for a wife. The man looks to Jesus. Jesus is because the father. The wife looks to the man. The headship's on the man, the leader. It doesn't mean the wife doesn't have responsibility. She's also a leader in the household. She has lots of responsibility. But the head of the household, just like when Eve ate of the fruit first, what fell on the man? The guilt, the shame. In Romans, talks about the man. Who sinned? Wait a second, but she did it first. It sh- the blame should be on her, right? Amen? Amen? Nobody? <laughs> it fell on the man because the headship is on the man. The responsibility of the well-being of the people placed under the man is on the man. The wife does have responsibility. Women, women do have responsibility, but in terms of leadership, in terms of responsibility, in terms of the well-being, in terms of Noah having faith in God because his outward expression of faith, the boat saved his whole family. And we need to understand this. We need to raise men. We need to raise heads of household, however that applies. We need to raise our families. We need to show them what, how we pray, how we read the scripture, how we communicate with one another. We ain't perfect, we understand that, but we need to be examples of God, right? Image bearers of Christ, because we're looking under Jesus, we need to ex- exemplify that to our families. That responsibility is on us. We can't push our kids off to church once a week and expect them to be raised in the Lord. Just like you can't try to uh, cultivate a relationship with somebody once a week. We already talked about that. In Proverbs, I'm going to close with this first, I promise. In Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. We've heard this verse a thousand times. It's probably on your refrigerator. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understandings. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will direct your path. Look, through all this craziness going on in the world right now, there's a lot of things that we may not understand. There's a lot of things that we may not um, know how to do or how to 
direct or lead our family. We're trying to put on a brave face. We may not know what's going on, who to believe. There's so much conflicting information out there these days, man. Who are we supposed to believe? One person says this works. Another person says it. this is how you stay safe. Another person says, no, that doesn't work. Conflicting science experiments. Government says something. Bible says something. What are we doing here? Darned if you do, darned if you don't. That's 2020 so far. But we need to remember on the scripture that we've read so many times, we need to trust in the Lord, trust, faith. We need to have faith in the Lord, if I can interchange that, with that all of our heart. Enoch, man, he, this, this was him. He had, with all of his heart, with all of his being, man, he had faith, this confidence, this trust in the Lord. And lean not on our own understandings. We don't know what to do a lot of times, man. The, the scripture says the heart is deceitfully wicked upon all things. We don't know what to do in our intellect. We don't know how to chase our feelings. In all your ways, acknowledge him, man. Always be giving thanksgiving and prayers and supplication to the Lord. Like, God, what am, I, what am I doing here? What do I do with my job? What do I do here with the safety? How do I direct my kids? In all your ways, acknowledge him, and guess what? He's going to direct your path. And when you feel like you haven't got an answer, you push in again. Because guess what? Knocking will be open, ask will be given to you, seek and you shall find. God, I feel like you've been quiet. Are you there? You listen to me. Man, be an Enoch. Walk with God and cultivate that relationship. Guess what? He's going to reward you for that. His word says, do you believe in it, church? In all your ways, acknowledge him in these crazy trying times that's going on, man. We need our paths directed by the person who has all foreknowledge. Amen? Amen. Who has all knowledge. All, he's omniscient. You, you picking up what I'm putting down, church? Amen. <laughs> all right, well, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for who you are. We just worship you and honor you and praise you this morning. God, we thank you that we can have trust in you, Lord. Anybody here who's lacking in faith, God, we ask you to strengthen them in this moment. Say, God, I need strength. God, I need help. Lord, strengthen any weakness in me. I have doubts, Lord. Help my unbelief, God. It's okay. We're asking him. We're seeking him. We're pushing in. Even when we're in our doubts, we could push in. When it's hardest to pray, that's when we need to pray hardest. So, God, anybody who, here who may be weak in the relationship, remind them, stir up in them, God. Strengthen them, God, uh, as they lead their families, God. Direct their path, Lord. Remind them, Lord, just to, in all your ways, Lord, we need to be acknowledging you. Holy Spirit, remind us. You have, we have a helper, a comforter within us. We're indwelled with the Holy Spirit. May we call upon you, Holy Spirit. Just remind us, guide us, nudge us on the path left and right if we start to, to, to veer away, God. May we earnestly seek you, earnestly desire you, Lord. Lord, we lift up to you every person here who may be in lack, who may be in need, who's lost a job, who may be having a health issue, who may be having a relationship issue, finance issue, God. We ask you that you meet them where they're at. Maybe their their marriage is, um, is not strong right now, God. Maybe they're questioning things, Lord. Just remind them of the vows that they made, God. Remind them of their first love when they first met each other, God. Remind them uh, increase their love for one another. May their kids see that, God. May they just rejoice in the Lord. Anybody who is dealing with sickness, God, we ask you to touch them and heal them. We claim the word of God upon them by, by um, the... On the cross, you bore sicknesses, infirmities, and by your stripes we are healed. It's done. We claim it. We have faith in what you said and what you did, God. Anybody who's dealing with financial issues, Lord, open up a door that no man could shut. Bless them financially, God. May we be able to discern in the spirit, God, and know how to interact in the physical. We don't war against flesh and blood, God. So show us how to discern the spiritual and how to interact in the physical. This was... uh, a word this morning when we were praying with the worship team. It's a word for somebody today. Show us how to discern in the spiritual so we know how to interact in the physical. God, show us truth. Lead us into all truth.